Okay, well, wonderful. Really good to um, come and speak to you all. And um, it's been just wonderful hearing about all the activities going on at this conference, but also by the Student Voice Australia project. Um, my name's Tom, I'm from the University of Portsmouth, as Belinda highlighted. And this is a session um, that I put together, really inspired by an article that came out from one of your keynote speakers, Molly, Don Molly Dollinger and her colleague, Kelly Matthews, where they made an argument to think, actually, we need to start connecting our student voice activities and partnership work. So in this presentation, I'm going to make a bit of a case. I haven't got necessarily the answer, but I'll be making a case for us to be thinking about all this wonderful activities we are doing under the student voice banner and ensuring we're connected with what we do. Um, a little about me first. My name is Tom. I work at the University of Portsmouth and I've really spent my entire career across the last 10 years working in all realms of student voice, from working as an institutional lead for student voice and employability at the University of Winchester, conducting a lot of research on the topic and, and being part of um, being the chair of a network which is all about student voice, the RAISE network. Um, but a lot of my reflections too in student voice come from being a student rep myself as an undergraduate student representative and then a student union vice president for two years, quite a long time ago now. Um, but many of my reflections come from being on the other side of the coin as well and being a student representative myself. So I'm really looking forward to sharing my reflections with you um, today. So the wider context, as I'm sure you've been speaking about across this conference, is actually student voice is not a new idea. The idea that students can have a say or should be part of enhancing their education is not new at all. Actually, scholars such as Dewey or Paolo Freire spoke about this a long time ago, uh, or over 100 years ago, in fact. And uh, actually, there's wider bodies around the world that actually said students have a right to have a say in their education, whether that's uh, the UN pre-education charter in 2011 or um, the Prague um, Communique which where a lot of European universities came together and said that students are competent and active and constructive partners in how we shape higher education. For any of you that have worked at other levels of education as well you'll know that student voice is um, it's a very prominent area of research it may be referred to as learner voice or pupil voice in primary and secondary educations. So the student voice context that higher education is now fantastically part of is definitely not alone and not the newest of ideas, but perhaps it's still a field that we're experimenting in and it's still a field in very complex institutions that are modern universities where we still need to innovate and we still need to explore. Um, looking at student voice within the wider student engagement discourse, um, I think student voice offers the opportunity for us to join our theories of how we think students are learning with actual practice and only through that dialogue will we be able to truly understand the learner experience and I think we need to continuously do this. Our student body is ever changing um, because we have a new set of students every year um, and also uh, the world is changing very very quickly as well not just in regards to technology in regards to generational change social change and progress let alone the um, the kind of cataclysmic and gigantic impact that the COVID-19 pandemic held, where now every student who is entering higher education will have witnessed some form of distance learning. Student voice is very much reliant on relationships between students and staff, and that's something I'll pick up during this presentation. That's not just um, students to staff, but also the organisation to students or student union and also how students interact with their fellow student representatives as well. And I can see from the hashtag you've been talking about across this last couple of days, the role of the student representative or the role of the student partner. And what does that role mean for the wider student body? Um, I've already highlighted that there's other search terms out there you may want to explore like learner voice or pupil voice. But Alison Cook-Saver and uh, Kathy Bovell and Peter Felton highlight that student voice is actually really the missing perspective. And I think we should all reflect sometimes that actually staff make up about 10% of our university population. Yes, on the majority of our decision-making bodies and committees, staff make up 95% plus. And actually there's a real skew really towards staff being in charge and empowering organisations, when actually those organisations wouldn't exist without the students. And I think including that missing perspective, um, increasing the percentage of that missing perspective is really important. 
So I'm sure over the last two days, as I've seen from on Twitter, there's two key areas of student engagement activity, which um, you will have been speaking about. And actually, when I speak about these topics, I split them. Um, one is student voice and one is student representation. And I know nation by nation, university by university, these activities can differ. Student voice I separate from student representation being any student and every student has a voice. And I would argue that a student voice conversation about education is anything from an informal chat to a set of emails. Um, there's lots of models out there to look at how we can make those informal chats and conversations about education more meaningful. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we go beyond our elective student course reps by having feedback forums or running university surveys. But this conversation with students, when we say, hey, how's it going? Or how are you finding it so far? Has been expanded and built upon in many nations around the world to create democratic representation systems of student voice in many HEIs. And I know this area of activity is going on where you all are um, on the other side of the world to me right now. Um, it's where students are probably represented at a course level, um, but they can also be on higher committees and sometimes you may have like a student president represent on those higher committees as well these two areas of activities together though i feel build the foundation for wider student voice activities such as student staff partnership research projects student surveys um, feedback forums and i think if you get these two areas right you can then build some fantastic opportunities upon them i think if these two areas are neglected and things can start going wrong. I'm obviously from the UK, as you can tell from my accent, and um, we are actually in a sector that heavily um, prioritised student voice for many years, particularly across the 2010s. Our equivalent to TEXA, um, our quality assurance agency, highlights that every university must take deliberate steps to engage all students individually and collectively, which is hard in the partners of quality assurance. And also in our uh, equivalent to your student experience survey in Australia, our national student survey actually has three questions and there's only 27 questions on this survey that ask these points around that students have the opportunities to give feedback, that staff value that feedback, and it's clear where that feedback was acted upon, the feedback loop we often speak about. Whenever I talk about student voice, I love highlighting this fantastic book. It's by a, a scholar called Adam Fletcher in the USA, who writes about student voice from kindergarten to PhD and uses the same lessons throughout, which I think is just wonderful. Um, Adam quite simply defines student voice as any expression, uh, oh, sorry, student voice as an expression of any student in any form about learning. Essentially, student voice is any conversation about their education. As soon as we use such a definition, it's far more inclusive. And I'm going to come on to that later on. He goes on to use lots of fantastic frameworks, but does say this, that um, actually his goal is talking about meaningful student voice or meaningful student involvement. And that's not just about listening. That's not just about having lots of gimmicks and schemes where students can give some feedback, but it's about acknowledging that feedback. It's about being committed to that feedback. It's promoting it. It's empowering both students and staff and expanding conversations. I think it's important to reflect on our student rep activities where most of the foundation of this activity goes on. I don't know all the, the ins and outs of your individual institutions, but largely student representatives are, it's an informal role. It's actually a role that you may exist in all the time where you are elected to be the class rep you may sit on only nine hours of committees a year, uh, maybe even less, uh, but you're all often there as a volunteer and perhaps supported by a central staff member or a student union. Um, but many have argued, as I've already highlighted, that student representation structures form the foundation for wider student engagement activities. And if you refer to Alex Buckley at Edinburgh Napier, who says that student engagement can occur in two zones, the political and the pedagogical, I would probably argue that student representation straddles to those both. And when I talk to student unions about student voice and representation, I always make a really important point that these activities rely on us meeting in the middle. So I think student engagement and student voice is about students and staff meeting halfway. I think a traditional non-student voice focused higher education indicated on the left of my slides here is where both students and staff aren't coming into those student voice spaces to talk about their education. 
I think students can become customers if students aren't being invited to meet halfway and perhaps they're sitting back and the staff feel like they're bending over backwards for those students. Actually, on the flip side, if um, I know there's a session earlier today on student activism, um, if staff aren't listening, then students are more likely to turn to activist measures to get their message across. Um, but really, we want to see our student engagement practices and student representation meetings of students and staff meeting halfway, perhaps in mutual spaces and shared spaces to talk about their education. Certainly an example of both students engaging and staff engaging. There's challenges out there though, and this brings me around to my argument. There's a big challenge going on at the moment in regards to all of these fantastic activities we have and a word called representativeness. Just because you have one student rep in the room or one student voice in the room, does their voice represent their fellow 30 classmates or their fellow 300 classmates or their fellow 30,000 students? It is not necessarily clear. And so there's a real concern around the representativeness of our student representatives. Alex Bowles writes about this very, very well. Um, and are those students truly representing themselves or reflecting the wider student body? I think when we become over-reliant on student union presidents, uh, course reps, that sometimes actually these roles could be inaccessible for some students because they require a lot of time. Sometimes they could require a lot of volunteering. Some students don't have the ability to volunteer excessively. Um, so we've got to reflect on how accessi accessible these roles are. So there's a lot going on, that is clear. There's lots of in-person activities going on in universities. There's lots of online activities going on. And we're now researching with students too. I'm not gonna go through these individually, but I think all of these come from a wonderful place. And by no means that I am critiquing any of these activities because they are all um, coming from a place of let's enhance education for our students. My argument perhaps is that there's a lot going on in our institution. So let's go on to talk about my argument because we're resourcing other things as well. We have um, student surveys, student reps, research projects, students as partners, student engagement and decision making on quality assurance committees. So, and actually I would argue we now have at many institutions student voice en masse, where student voice is going on everywhere. The concern is there's a lot going on. And what about representativeness? What about accessibility, as Sarah O'Shea highlights? What about connectiveness, which was really the paper that inspired me, where Matthews and Dollinger talked about the differences between student representatives and students as partners. How equitable are all these opportunities to students who maybe face barriers already to their higher education? And then I've seen somebody tweet about it already at this conference, the age-old age -old discussion of do we pay for these student opportunities or do we not? Well, right now we're paying for some and we're not paying for others. So I think that question is still worthy of tabling. I worry that we've got lots going on in the expanding universe of student voice and actually um, if we include things even like emails and discussions and research, we have got so many different things going on in this space of student voice. And I worry that they're all going off in wonderful directions alone and they're unconnected. But the only thing that unites all of these areas of activity is the student, because we are asking the student to engage in all of these activities. I'm, I've gone to lots of universities around the UK and helped them audit their student voice opportunities. And some universities are conducting 60 surveys during a three year undergraduate degree. That's 20 surveys a year. That's just too many, you know, so are we asking too much and are we being a bit chaotic with our good intentions in our student voice activities? So I take a, a broad definitions of student voice as Adam Fletcher highlighted. So absolutely probably the most, the most basic form of student voice we think of is someone putting their hand up and saying, I didn't understand that or the deadline you just highlighted is different in the module handbook to what you've just said in class. It's those discussions. It's also emails to everybody. And I've done research on the feedback loop and a lot of students are referring to the feedback loop as responding times to emails. It's your student reps, as I've already highlighted, your national surveys, your student union. It's also complaints as well, everybody. And complaints, official university complaints are often hidden in institutions, very private. They're a form of student voice. They're a negative form of student voice, but they're an important form of student voice. And I've often said that we need to be welcoming to all forms of feedback, positive or not. And as soon as we 
ignore and say, no, 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 we can't include that in the student voice dichotomy. Actually, to the students, that is part of that picture, but we need to ensure that it's something we welcome and talk about as well. All of these count as student voice too. And I think if the other barrier uh, pathways are closed, students will move towards these areas of student voice. And these are absolutely forms of student voice, perhaps ones that some universities wouldn't like to talk about. Um, well, every student has the right to protest and, and to, to, uh, uh, to share their views in that way. But also every student now has the ability to just post on social media what they think. If we're not open in our feedback pathways, then students will go to those uh, lengths and where they might not even need the press anymore because social media offers them far um, more um, instantaneous um, noise than any going to the press would. But of course, going to the press counts as that. So we have all these activities and for all of them, we've got to try and create some form of feedback loop. Here's a feedback loop that I've used in student rep trainings in the past. Um, I think the feedback loop is an ideal but in reality, it's very, very difficult. It's perhaps easy in some structured means, very difficult in others. And what's really happening on the ground? Well, here's a picture. Um, I'm actually in this picture in 2013 um, of some, um, uh, a bit of student rep publicity we did at the University of Winchester when I was a vice president of education. But what's really happening is off, this shows that you're together as student reps, but often that student rep is alone in the meetings, often that student rep is alone in that email chain, and often that student rep, although they are supported by their fellow students, is alone. And often, sometimes the lecturer looks like this. Um, I've done a lot of work over many years around trying to calm down those student voice meetings where people go in very defensive. I'm defensing my course, I'm defensing my teaching, I'm defensing my curriculum. And sometimes that student voice meeting can become a bit of a battle. What's also potentially really happening is we have endless means of students to give feedback and we're shouting give us voice give us feedback give us voice and it can feel like you're throwing a paper airplane off a off a cliff edge really that if yes you can submit that feedback but where's it gone what's happening with that feedback we don't really know and i'm very concerned that we have higher education institutions where our student voice exchanges look a bit like the flight trader app where you there's just thousands and thousands of little bits of student voice going around the organization and we're not really clear what's going on where. So I think there's an argue, as I come towards the end of my presentation, there's an argument to connect our opportunities for student voice. And I've just used a really small example here, which is by no means conclusive, to highlight how we could do this in some form of framework. This has been inspired by um, looking at first at complaints at the University of Winchester, where there is four phases to students to make a complaint. So I actually started with um, the perhaps deemed more negative area of student voice where students can do a local complaint where they just it's resolved at a local level a local formal which is a written complaint at a faculty level a university complaint and the oia is the uk sector body for complaints and then actually saying well actually if this is a framework of student voice and as you go up you have to put more effort in more time what's the what's the lowest contact time version of student voice well that's open dialogue about education um, what's the next look? Well, filling in a survey, speaking to your student rep, can, taking part in a student staff partnership project, engaging in quality assurance, and then working with your SU. By mapping it out like this, you can start to say, actually, what is our student voice menu, perhaps? And what are we doing? And how does this connect? I think you can go further and audit all of your opportunities. And this is an activity I've done. Uh, this is hypothetically based on a UK university. Um, and I've categorized them as institutional feedback thing options. These are things we put serious time and money into. Um, and actually, I think my conclusion from looking at your institutional opportunities is saying that actually every department and staff member should be, have the responsibility for closing the feedback loop. It's not just the student voice lead, the student rep officer, the vice president of education, the dean of students, actually every staff member has to be on board in responding and connecting student feedback. I think there's bigger activities that we've created all from a good place, student experience committees, students engage on quality assurance panels, co-design students as partnership. We're engaging students to have ownership and this activity is also worthy of reflecting upon. But in these activities, you could also engage our students in closing the feedback loop and connecting our activities too. 
because if the feedback doors are shut or if this is messy then there can be less ownership and that's what we want from our student voice activities but i also think if we get some of all of these wonderful activities wrong we could be falling into that student as customer mindset so that's my presentation for you all. My name's Tom, I just wanted to share that idea with you. I don't have the answers at all. Uh, my email's on the screen there. It's Tom at, it's Tom Lowe at Port, um, not Tom Lowe at Port. Um, and um, I wrote a book on the topic uh, a couple of years ago um, called um, A Handbook for Student Engagement in Higher Education, um, where I talk about many of these ideas, um, as well as um, scholars from around the world. And um, the RAISE network is also a fantastic network to look at. But I'll stop sharing my screen and open to questions. Thank you so much, Tom. And you're welcome to share that link um, in the chat afterwards, if you like. Um, on the floor, did anyone have any questions? If you just want to use the raise hand feature. Yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much, Tom. No worries at all. No, and there is, saying. yeah, there is so much. So uh, I think you explained it really well um for your institution's example and i'm sure we've all um got a better understanding of the different layers at our own institutions i think it's about just drawing things out as well so um there's one nice activity there's many activities you can do um it, one is where you get um you know flip chart paper and you stick about six of them together so it's a really long line and you make a really long table for a classroom you draw a line along it and then you go along as a group of staff and write every time along the student journey where you ask for students feedback mm -hmm. and that can be quite revelationary I mean in a sense universities are quite siloed in what they do sometimes because we're just massive you know it's no one's guilty of this um, and as I said it all comes from the best intentions but the one common person who's engaged in all of that is the student themselves um, so there's a lot going on in the UK right now where people are saying oh we need to we're just emailing students too much we're just surveying students too much we're just asking and we need to be a bit more strategic because even though we think we're very organized maybe as the library service or as a course team um where we say well we're engaging students three times a year that's great if every department's engaging students three times a year it comes like 29 times a year and you can and i've met students and spoken to them they said crikey me university you just keep asking me how to run things you know um and um i think it's interesting to be a balance well, thank yeah, you it's Laura. a challenge finding that balance, isn't it? But yeah, it your is. example of um, 60 surveys across um, an undergraduate degree, it's, yeah, I'm yeah. sure once you count it up, it's pretty outstanding. Yeah, a survey audit is really healthy to do, I think, yeah. organisations, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tom. If there's no other final questions, we really appreciate your time and your presentation today. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you all for coming along and thank you for the kind words on the right. That's lovely. Really good to be here.